I hopefully enjoyed our community time earlier. Uh, this idea of being sucked into something, I think all of us are guilty of, right? So all of us have been sucked into something at one point in time or the other. In a moment of weakness, you've been sucked into something. I'll give you a few examples from my own life. So <clears throat> how many of you guys have been uh, fell for an internet scam before? Like I have, you, you know, clickbait, you click on it, and then uh, it's something you didn't realize it was. We've all done that. Secondly, um, how many of you guys, especially if you're older, right, you get older than 30 plus now, you went to the fair and you know you shouldn't get on that ride, but yet you were tempted to get on the ride and then the next thing you know, <clears throat> your head's spinning and it feels like your fried Twinkies will come back up. Anybody with me? Right, right. We've been there. We've been sucked into that. Hey, how about this? How about uh, one of you has a, a spouse who's who sucked you into watching a movie you shouldn't have watched, right? right? Like, like my wife tells me all the time when it comes to chick flicks. Oh, you'll like this one. This one's really funny. You'll like it. And then the next thing I know, two hours later, I'm bored out of my brains, right? Ready for the movie to be over. So we've all been sucked into things and we can laugh about them because it is funny. But I think if we're being honest, though, we've all been sucked into things also that are a little more serious and things that we have later regretted, right? So many of us in here were teenagers at one time and you've taken that hit or that sip at that party, right? Because it was tempting, it was luring. And you later regretted it, right? Because now you've been struggling with an addiction maybe for years, right? We were sucked in. Maybe there was that person that said they loved you, but they kept tempting you and kept tempting you in this area that you knew was wrong. And one day you gave in, and now you have to live with regrets for the rest of your life, right? At least they're in your mind. You keep regretting them. Maybe you were sucked in in that case. Maybe there was a work decision, a business decision that seemed enticing. Maybe it was a of great benefit to you financially. You were sucked in, but yet there was also this element of it that was very unethical, and you were sucked in because of the enticing dollar figures behind that decision, right? So we've all been sucked into these things, and here's the one thing that I've learned from me, myself, journeying through making many mistakes, as many of you have, is all of us have this instinct to blame others and to blame our circumstances, do we not? We, we all have this instinct inside of us. And yeah, there may be some truth to the fact that there are others to blame, or maybe there is uh, some circumstances to blame. But at the end of the, the day, guys, who is responsible for you? Yourself, right? We all are. I think we all agree to that. I tell my kids that all the time, and, we, and I know we tell children that, but at the same time as adults, we have to be reminded every single day that we are responsible for our own decisions. And if we're being honest... When we think back to these items or these things that we were sucked into, was there not something inside of us that made us a little more vulnerable to being sucked in? Right? Every single one of us were sucked in because there was something inside of us that made us desire whatever it is that we stepped into. In fact, if just going through my examples here just for a second to make, us, uh, make this relatable, when it came to the fair ride, getting on the fair ride that I know I shouldn't have, what was going on inside of me? Right? There was this desire maybe to show that I'm not over the hill, right? I can still do it. Maybe there was this pride inside of me showing that I want to show that, hey, I've still got it, right? And then I later regretted it, right? But there's this desire inside of me trying to prove myself. Or maybe when it came to taking that sip or that hit that you later regretted, I'm sure there are probably 10,000 reasons why you did it. Maybe it was the desire to fit in. Maybe it was the desire to, to be loved or, 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 or wanted. Maybe it was the desire to to be able to abandon maybe these thoughts or this life that you were living. Or maybe in the case of watching that chick flick, maybe some of you men thought there would be something that would happen afterwards to make it worth sitting through the movie, right? There's, there's always these enticements that draw us into being sucked into things that sometimes we later regret. So you may be wondering, so Mark, what's the big deal? Like if these are natural desires inside of us that draw us into these, these decisions, What's the big deal, right? Because it's all natural. Because to God, it is a big deal. And we're going to see that this morning in 2 Timothy 2. You guys read along with me. So verse 20 of chapter 2 says, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes, and some are for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. So in this series we're in called Last Words, guys, we've been journeying through the book of 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy, this is a letter written by Paul, 
what he thought was going to be his last words that he was able to share with his friend, protege, his disciple, Timothy. Because Paul was in prison. He was on his deathbed. He was going to be persecuted and most likely executed, he knew. And so he wanted to pin down what he thought would be the best words of advice to give to his fellow, uh, fellow laborer in the kingdom, that is Timothy. So he penned this letter to Timothy to give practical advice, not only to Timothy and how to lead the churches, but also he wanted to give practical advice to the believers, to the Christians of the local church, and how they are to walk faithfully with God. And so here, he uses this example of a large house. So this large house, by the way, Paul is using as a metaphor. He's speaking of the church when he refers to the large house, okay? The church is a group of people who are united under the lordship of Jesus. People who have been saved. People who are his children, right? That is who the church is. It's not a building we attend to. It's a group of people. So in this large church, or in this large house, rather, the church... God says there will be different vessels or different instruments. Some will be for special use and some will be for common use. Now, what is he talking about? He says if you want to be used for special purposes or special uses, then you must be cleansed of the latter. Now, what is he talking about when he says cleansed of the latter? If you were to go back and to read the first chapter and the beginning part of chapter 2, you'll see that Timothy in his day, their, their churches were struggling with a lot of things, okay? First of all, they were struggling with false teachers. False teachers. People who came in and proclaimed the the, the truth of God, but in reality, it wasn't the truth of God. Right? They said it was God's truth, but it really wasn't. They also were struggling with the fact that so many Christians were running away from what Paul and others had been teaching them to follow. They were starting to fall into wickedness and not pursue righteousness. And so Paul was warning them, listen, if you want to be used by God as a vessel for his use, for good use, he says that, first of all, you have to repent. You have to turn from your wickedness. You have to turn from these false teachers and return to the truth. So this passage we're working through, or this letter, is really just a list of how-tos, guys. Very practical advice. Like sometimes people accuse the Bible of not being very practical. You read 2 Timothy, it's very practical. Very practical. So listen, many of us, and I'm going to talk to to those of us in here who may have been Christians for a while, or maybe at the minimal, you've been going to church for a while, right? Maybe you grew up in the church or whatever your context is. A lot of us tend to get in this mode where we just live everyday life as if God isn't real, okay? What I mean by that, it's not saying that you don't say your blessing before a meal or something like that. But we tend to think that God was very present that day that we gave our life to him. But every day afterwards is just a waiting for us to go to heaven. And the time in between salvation and heaven is really like this kind of holding period, right? Where you just kind of do your own thing and live life and try not to screw up too bad. But there's not a lot of purpose to it. But let me tell you this. If you, in fact, have been rescued by God, in other words, you recognize that you are a sinner that you have sinned against the holy God, that there is no hope for you apart from his death and his resurrection, that you cannot save yourself through your own works. If you recognize this, listen, listen, God saved you for a purpose. Not not just for you one day to see him in in heaven, but for every moment there on out for you to live for his glory. You see, he didn't save you just for yourself. He saved you for himself. You with me? He saved you to bring him glory. And so this idea of the fact or th- that we just live life and there's really not a lot of purpose in between salvation and heaven, guys, you're missing the point. You're missing it. God wants us to know that he wants to use you as a golden vessel prepared for his special purposes. You with me? He also says in this passage, which blows my mind, that there are vessels that will be used for common purposes. What he's referring to there is Those of us that continue to live in our life of sin. He says if you continue to live in a life of sin, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not saved. But what he is saying is you are living a life of disobedience. And you're not honoring me. And he, man, God is so gracious and merciful. Guys, you need to hear this. He even chooses to use us as vessels even though we are sinning against him. Like that, that's crazy to think about, but God is so gracious and merciful, isn't he, church? Yes. 
But he would much rather us, right, prepare ourselves and to be vessels that he can use for his glory because we're honoring him with all of our lives. And we're not living in constant sin. So how can we be used as special instruments? That's really the question that we're looking at today because in Paul's day, or in Timothy's day, rather, there were lots of false teachers leading them astray. So I want you to look back at this verse with me. Pastor Dylan talked about this verse last week online. This is verse 15 of chapter 2. It says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. What is the word of truth? It is the Bible, the scriptures, right? That is the word of truth. So he says, we need to be able to correctly handle, to correctly believe, to correctly pursue the word of truth. So listen, if you are a teacher, a teacher of God's word like myself or some other leaders that we have been given the responsibility to be teachers of the church, guess what? He tells us we have a high calling, right? We have to be able to rightly hear interpret and explain God's word. Listen, everyone under the teaching of God's word, listen, this isn't just for pastors. He tells every single Christian, if you are mine, then you must be listening, you must be reading, you must be interpreting and applying God's word correctly. The fancy word we use is doctrine. We must believe the correct things about God and ourselves so that we know how to live rightly. Now, if you follow the news at all, you know there are many denominations right now that are fighting over these type of items as we speak. Many are splitting. Many of them are splitting over their views of God's word. Because get this, and I know you guys know this, but let's just say it. It's much easier just to ride the wave of culture than it is to stand on truth. Because at the end of the day, to ride the wave of culture will get you more social media followers, right? But standing on truth will make you be very divisive at times. But God says, what's more important, standing on my truth or going with culture? Hey, guys, listen, if you follow the sifting sands of culture, there's no telling where you'll be in a few years. You with me? Because culture is constantly changing. Right and wrong in our culture is far different this year than it was last And if you compare this year to last, or this decade to last decade, you can see even a bigger divide. So what God is saying, if you want to know truth, guess what? You need to be able to discern and rightly divide the word of truth. Because if not, you'll be like culture, and you're right from wrong, and your due north will continue to change. So yes, there will be false teachers in droves. The New Testament, guys, the the portion of the Bible written after Jesus talks about false teachers in just about every single book, okay? And false teachers aren't just someone who stands up, who looks sketchy, who you can kind of identify from far off, who you say, that guy, he's teaching heresy, right? It's it's not always that easy, right? Many times, false teachers look just like you or I. They, They look normal, they act normal, but yet, if you listen to them, if you know God's word, they have deviated from what God's word actually says. You with me? So we have to be Wise, We have to be understanding. We have to know God's word. Here's the thing about God's word, guys. Either you believe it completely or you don't. I'm going to say it again. Either you believe it completely or you don't. It's not a buffet line that you get to pick and choose what you believe. God's word is grouped together, right? Yes, it is 66 different books. But God says either you believe it all or you don't. And the goal of this church, I can tell you, is to proclaim salvation to the world. But this salvation is made known through God's word, right? Everything about this church, guys, is based on the foundation of God's word. Without it, we have no foundation. It's without error. It is our sole source of reliable truth. So now that we're done with the intro, how do we become vessels used by God for honorable use. It's actually fairly simple, but it's not very easy. You with me? The scriptures are fairly simple, but they're not always easy to abide in, are they? So let's read some practical advice that, uh, that Paul gives Timothy in 2 Second Timothy. And let me give you some advice here. This, 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 chap, this chapter, really the whole book, is jammed full of practical advice. Like literally we could spend 
a whole sermon on like one word of this verse. So please go home, do your homework, research, pray over, apply this to your own life, okay? We have a, a window here where I'm going to give you what God has been teaching me through. But guys, listen, apply, go home and apply this yourself in your own quiet times. Verse 22 says this, very practical, flee. Everybody repeat after me. What does he say? Flee. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. If you don't want to be sucked into the evil desires of your heart, what's it say? Flee. Flee. He doesn't say, go sit down with a counselor and talk about how you feel, right? He doesn't say, you know, go, go try to make a bullet point list of things you can do better. He doesn't say, try to fix it. He doesn't say, try to have more self-control. The very first thing he says is, flee. It's not to say that we don't need help. It's not to say there aren't some other things we can do. But the very first thing he says, if we're not going to be sucked in, is we got to flee. Guys, you have to run. God hates sin. He hates it. It's not something that we can play around with and take lightly. If not, you will be sucked in and you will be dishonoring God. He says to flee, to flee. When I have this conversation with a group of men specifically, I get some pushback, right? Us guys, we want to think we're tough, like we've got it all together. Right? We want to put on this facade that nothing can beat us, nothing can break us. So when you hear the words flee, you think weakness, right? It's oftentimes what we think of. And you think, well, I, that just ain't me, man. I'm not, I'm not, I don't run from anything. What does God tell us to do here, guys? He says, flee. You need to, re, you need to realize this, gentlemen. I'm going to talk to the guys specifically for a second. Until you realize how weak you are, guys, you're in a bad place. Yep. Jesus tells us over and over again, those who will inherit the kingdom of God must be Weak. You must be broken. You must understand that you can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and honor God and get to God to, re to receive his salvation. He tells us, no, for you to be saved, you have to realize that it's impossible to be saved on your own. You are weak. And guys, you need to hear me. The sins, the youthful lust, as it calls them here in the scripture that we struggle with, until you realize how weak you are overcoming this on your own, you're going to continue to fail to it day after day after day. He tells us here, flee. You hear me? Flee. Don't play around with it. Flee. So get this. Here's just a few practical examples. Some of you need to hear this. If you're the type of person that your lust in your heart is getting drunk, you know you just can't go to a party or whatever and just have one beer. You, just, you know you don't have it. You can't do it. So what should you do? Flee, right? Flee. Don't do it. Get rid of that 12-pack in the fridge, right? Get rid of it. Flee. If you know you don't have that self-control, flee. If you know you struggle with greed, and every time you get a little extra jingle in the pocket, you got to go spend it somewhere, right? What does he say? He don't say get online and shop around and have self-control. He says flee. You hear me, church? Guys, we can't play with sin. We have to know ourselves, and the way we know ourselves is by rightly dividing the word of truth. When we hear from God and he convicts us of sin, from that moment forward, guys, we must constantly flee. Hey, listen, let me, let me speak to this just for one second. This even applies to those things that feel natural to us. Okay? Because here's, here's the deal. Some of you need to take this home with you. Just because you desire something and something seems natural, don't make it right. You with me? Just because you desire something and something seems natural to you doesn't make it right. Again, our source of truth is not how we feel. What seems natural, our source of truth is God's word. And if God's word differs from what seems natural to us, then guess what? We must conform to his word and flee from that thing that continues to try to suck us in. I was recently speaking to a longtime friend of mine who struggles with same-sex attraction. And yes, we don't have time to dive into that, but the scriptures are pretty clear that the practice of homosexuality is sinful. If you want to talk about that afterwards, we can some. But this particular guy who's a dear friend, guys, who I care deeply about, he fought for years. 
but he shared with me that recently he's just given back into to this lifestyle. And he said because he's given back in because it just seems natural for him. You with me? It just seems natural. Can I tell you all something? Whatever the case may be, every single one of us in here, every one of us has things inside of us that feels natural that's not right. Are you with me? Every one of us is pulled in a direction that is not honoring to God. And yes, it feels natural, right? I think all of us have at least one thing in our mind right now. We all have this. It's part of being in a sin-filled world that is cursed by the curse of sin, right? All of us are going to be drawn to things that are not honoring to God. It's called life according to Scripture. But God tells us just because it feels natural doesn't necessarily mean it's honoring to God. Listen, guys, when Jesus died on the cross, he sacrificed everything so that you can be saved. And in return, he tells us our responsibility or the greatest gift we can give back to him is to sacrifice ourselves for him, to present ourselves as living sacrifices, how Paul says it. So there's no cost too great to give up in our life if it means honoring God, is there? Nothing, no, nothing too great. Paul says, flee. But cleansing, listen, fleeing and cleansing, becoming the vessels that God wants us to be, it's not just about running from something, it's also about running to something. You with me? So it's all, all, all about preparing ourselves for what God will do. So you guys can write this down. This is the big point we want to unpack from this passage today. It's this, to be ready to be used by God. That's the key, to prepare ourselves. To be ready to be used by God, we must, one, flee the things that do not honor God. But secondly, we must pursue the things that do honor God. So I've got a, I've got a metal building behind my house. That's where I've got my lawnmower and other stuff in it. Lots of junk, to be honest with you. But in the summertime, it's really bad because there's holes and gaps and stuff in it. It's really bad about wasps making nests in, the, in, in that barn. Anybody got a barn like that in the backyard? It's like a, a wasp haven. So sure enough, about every year, I'll go in to get something out about this time of year in the summertime, and there's a wasp nest in there. Now, if I'm lucky, I see it beforehand. If I'm not lucky, I stir up the hornet's nest. And so it seems like all the time, I'm in there fooling around, and the next thing I know, there's like a bajillion wasps coming out of this nest, right? What do you think I do? Do you think I offer these wasps a cup of coffee and see if we can handle this, you know, and talk, talk through our problems? No, I get my butt out of there. I flee. You hear me? I get out of that barn and I get away from those wasps. But where am I running to? I'm not just running aimlessly. I'm one, running purposely away from the wasp. I'm running towards safety. You hear me? God tells us in this passage, yes, we are to flee evil desires. But look at the rest of verse 22. But what are we running towards? He tells us to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So we're not to do it alone. You hear that, church? So this idea of watching a TV preacher and having a Bible at home and not doing life for the local church, it's not, not here, not really anywhere. He tells us we must do it with others, do it with the local church. Don't have anything to do with foolish or stupid arguments. By the way, I can't believe Paul would say this. Like, obviously, in his day, they were much less advanced than us, right? Because today, like, we're way, way too advanced to have foolish and stupid arguments, aren't we? Like, we would never be guilty of arguing with someone on Facebook, would we? Like, even though we know it's not going anywhere, we know no one's going to win the argument. Like, come on, for real? We wouldn't do that. We're too smart, right, church? Paul says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. In these verses, Paul gives us some very practical advice and we don't have time to literally go through every single one of them. But Pastor Dylan last week, I feel like he gave us a really good paradigm for how to, how to really read this passage well. If you guys missed it, by the way, we put all our messages on YouTube. So go back and hit up our YouTube channel, subscribe to it. You'll get updates. But last week he talked about this idea of 
trying to discern what is our responsibility versus what is God's. And that's very important for us to know, right? And he referred to our responsibility as being inputs, things that we do to prepare ourselves to be used by God, things that God commands us to do. But we also have to realize that we can't control the outcomes, right? God's in control. God is the one that's sovereign. God has control of the results, but he does tell us to participate with these inputs. And so he goes through this practical list of what you might would call inputs here. He tells us to pursue things. So let's walk through each one of them. He tells us that we are not only to flee from sin, we are to pursue righteousness. Righteousness, yeah, I get it. If you're new to church, it's probably a fancy long word you may not understand. In the scriptures, righteousness essentially means being right before God. Okay? So he tells us to pursue what is right. How do we do that? First of all, we have to know God's word. It has to inform what is right. Right? Just because you hear it from your grandmother or your mother doesn't necessarily mean it's always right. But when you hear it from God's word, we can put it in the bank, right? It is right. He tells us to pursue righteousness. Secondly, he says to pursue faith. You see, faith isn't a magic bullet just that saves you, right? It's just like you, you, sometimes we view faith as just one thing that saved us a while back, and then we just live. No, faith is more like a garden that must be cultivated, right? God wants to grow our faith over time. So there's work that we have to put in, right? We have to ask God for faith. We have to pursue him and ask him to grow our faith. He tells us to pursue love. This is both towards God and towards others, right? It's the great commandment, right? He tells us to love God and to love others. This is something we have to constantly ask ourselves. How are we doing? We have to go out of our way to love others. Do we not, church? He tells us to pursue these things. He tells us to pursue peace. Again, this is both towards God and towards others. If there's sin between you and God, guess what? There's riffraff there. He wants us to pursue peace. He wants to keep short accounts with him. The same applies to others. If you've got bitterness in your heart towards someone, he tells us to pursue peace. You hear me, church? To be quick to forgive, to be quick to pursue. We have to pursue these things. But who does it say do these things with? He said the people of God, right? Like, like we are to pursue these things with the people of God. So don't forget one of the most important aspects of this. is just It's not just you sitting down with your Bible and talking to God, which is, yes, very important. But it's you sitting down with your Bible in the local church. And discussing and praying together and pushing each other forward. And kicking each other in the rear once in a while. We need that, right? We need others. He says, don't get caught up in disputes and arguments because that just distracts you. Listen, church, we have to stay focused as a church. God has told us what he wants us to do. It's to make disciples of all nations. Here we say to live for God, to love all people, to lead others to do the same. Hey, listen, we cannot be distracted by the day in and day out minor distractions and, and, and disunity that can come our way. We have to focus, we have to ask for peace, we have to pursue unity, we have to stay away from distractions and arguments. You hear me, church? So God wants us to flee. He wants us to flee everything that dishonors him. He wants us to pursue what honors him. And he wants us to be preparing ourselves to be used as vessels to glorify his name. Notice I keep saying preparing ourselves. Because guess who's in charge of the results of this whole thing? It's God, right? This isn't an equation, right? It's not like A plus B always equals C. But he does tell us that we always are to prepare ourselves. So we are always get A and B lined up, and then we trust the results to God. You with me, church? God's going to use us as he sees fit, but our job is to be honoring every day, all throughout our life, right? right. And we can't do this on our own. This is why God gives us his spirit. His spirit is what comes inside of us upon salvation, And this is how God enacts his plan. This is what God does. He gives us the power in order to be able to live for him. Let's wrap up by looking at the last couple of verses here in this section. I'm going to read verse 24 again. He says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach. You hear that? Able to teach, not resentful. Look at verse 25. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, <clears throat> and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of who? The devil. It's real clear there, right? He's not a make believe character, he is real. <clears throat> 
who has taken them captive to do his will. According to verse 25, anybody who is not honoring God's word is called what? <clears throat> Opponents. Opponents. Not someone who's just maybe a little off in what they believe. Not someone who, who, who's nice and kind, but they're just, they just think about things differently. No. Paul says, God says, they are opponents. You hear me? Opponents. But does that mean we treat them like jerks? Right? No. What's it say here? No, we treat them with grace, right? We do stand firm on the truth of God. But the whole goal, listen here, is to bring them to repentance, right? To bring them to a point of understanding through prayer, and through pursuit, to where they will align themselves with what God, what God really says to his word. We want to lead them back to Jesus, not make a fool of them. You hear me, church? So everything we are to do is in grace and mercy. Because guess what? If somebody hadn't led you to Jesus, where would you be today? Same place, right? Stuck, stuck, being stuck with Satan. He's, man, he's, guys, listen, Satan is so good at deceiving. He's so good at it. And unless we have people helping lead us to Jesus and show us the truth, then you may be stuck in your ways also. So God calls us, listen, even with false teachers, he calls us to be merciful and gracious, leading them to repentance. So what are we to do to prepare ourselves? He says we are to lead ourselves, to lead others to repentance through knowledge of the truth. And yes, I get it. This passage is Paul writing to Timothy, who was a leader of the church. So you may be thinking, isn't this just advice for pastors? No. If you read it, you can see clearly he's trying to communicate truths that will be applicable to every one of us. And here he says that he wants every one of us to be able to teach to teach. I want to, I want to zoom in on this for one second as we wrap up, okay? How are you to lead someone to the Lord? How are you to help someone who is confused or maybe misled in their beliefs? He says we must be able to teach. This is every one of us. Can we have a moment of real honesty with ourselves just for a moment? I want every single purpose, every single per person in here rather, to think with me for one second, okay? I'm asking you a question here that I want you to reflect on for the next few seconds. Can you teach people? I'm not asking, can you be the next Billy Graham and stand up in a stadium full of 100,000 people and, and present, right? I'm asking you, can you teach people? Teach them what? Teach them the very basic truths of God's word. Can you teach them the very basics of the gospel? Paul says very clearly here that we are to be able to teach. Peter says elsewhere we are to be ready at all times to give a reason, to give a defense, to teach others what is this hope that is within us. Guys, if you can't teach others, you're not where God wants you to be. He tells us we are to prepare ourselves to be used by him. Let me ask you this. If your coworker came up and asked you today, or let's say tomorrow, rather, came up and asked you, hey, man, I know you go to church, and I've heard you say something about salvation. Could you teach me, like, what, how I could be saved? Being real with yourselves, you don't have to answer out loud at all. Could you tell them and teach them the basic message of the gospel? Could, could you lead them to Jesus? And some of you, I get it in your heart, you're thinking, well, Pastor, that's your job. No, no, no. You read the scriptures. Never, ever does it say it's the sole responsibility of a church leader to lead people to Jesus. That is every one of our privileges. And I get it in your mind. You can think of a thousand reasons why you can't do that or whatever. But listen, let me, let me, let me just break it down. Let's make it real. If someone came up to any one of you guys here who, who has a child or a grandchild or maybe a pet or something that you care deeply about, and they ask you questions about it. Hey, tell me about little Johnny or Susie. Guys, listen, you wouldn't hesitate, right? Quickly, you'd be like, man, they love sports. They love fish. They, you would just kind of rattle off. Because why? It's, it's easy for us to talk about things that we love, right? right? If you love the Lord, we need to know him so well that we are ready, that we are willing, that we are always speaking of him. We have to be able to teach. You hear me, church? And if you need help with that, please let us know.
Think about it practically for one second. If I tell the gospel every single day of my life, I might reach some people, right? But if every single person online and every single person in here, if we share the gospel day in and day out because you're able to, how many more people can we reach with the gospel? How many more people can we help bring to repentance, as this passage says, to help them align with the truth of God's word? We must be able to teach. And the only way that's possible, listen, guys, is by knowing God's word, to being able to rightly divide it, as he says. So to put a bow on it, God calls us to flee things that do not honor God. He calls us to pursue things that do honor God. And he calls us to teach others along the way so that we are ready to be used by God whenever he decides to move. You with me, church? We want to be ready. When God gets ready to move, listen, Life Spring Church, we need to be ready to move. Let's, go, let's let God work through us. Let's pray. Jesus, you are so good, God, and you are so merciful and gracious, God, that even when we are choosing to live in rebellion, Lord, you still choose to use us and somehow work through that for your glory, God, but you would much rather us walk with pure hearts, walking in the power of your spirit, fleeing those things that we know will entangle us, God, and pursuing righteousness and love and peace, Lord God. Give us the power, give us the grace to do that, God. Prepare our hearts to be able to teach and lead others to yourself, God. I pray that this church, every single person under your preached word today, would apply this message, Lord, would apply your word and begin to rightly divide the word of truth and be able to teach that to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.